run through the basics about the political parties, especially now this is, there's more than two, um, and a lot of people don't actually understand the differences between them or the internal like factions within those um, parties as well. Um, so I'm going to start with the ALP. Apparently people didn't know that Bill Shorten was from the right and Tony Plibersex from the left, but as is like, as in every party there are factions, and broadly speaking the Labour Party has a broad right and a broad left faction. Um, Bill Shorten comes from the right, Tony's from the left. Um, you know, key left figures would be Tanya Plibersek, who's the Deputy Labour Leader, Anthony Albanese, who was the um, contender to uh, Bill at the last um, uh, pre-selection for becoming leader of the party, you know, Penny Wong, who is the uh, leader of the opposition in the Senate, um, and key right figures with people like Bill Shorten, Wayne Swan, Kevin Rudd, loosely from the right as well. Um, with the constituencies of the Labour Party, it's actually quite of a mismatch, which reflects, if you understand the groups that the Labour Party has to try and win in order to win government, you understand some of the policy positions that we have chosen to take um, in order to reflect that, right? Because on one hand, we've got a group of like educated progressives, university students, um, you know, well-educated middle class, um, upper middle class people who um, considered themselves progressives that historically maybe voted for the Liberals, but in the last sort of 50 years or so have drifted, toward, drifted towards Labor, and quite recently are starting to drift towards the Greens. Um, so that's sort of one constituency that's split between Labor and the Greens that both sides are trying to fight for and to win back. Um, but historically, the Labor Party was really a party for the working people, right? That's why the union movement was brought into it, and the union movement is still a really fundamental part of the Labor Party because the Labor Party, as in its name, is for you know, pe like for people who work um, uh, within the working class. In the past, obviously, when Australia sort of first became a country, the working class in Australia is very white because that's pretty much most of the people that were in this country. Um, and that was the base of the Labour Party that kept us going for a long time and the base that we're still trying to hold on to, subject to, again, filtering to parties like the Nation or the Liberals, depending on social conservatism. Um, and a demographic that's actually quite recently, well, not recently-ish, been like really strong Labour supporters are also um, minority groups. That's why if you look at suburbs that have really large, high proportions of minorities, you know, suburbs like, for example, the western suburbs, um, which are really labour strongholds, or the South East, or Western Sydney. Um, those, again, are something else that a uh, uh, constituency of the Labour Party tries to uh, win over and, and um, represent. So that's a fairly wide um, demographic, and again, if you understand what we're trying to win over, then you have to understand the internal party tension that goes over when one constituency one, 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 you know, wants something, when another one wants something else. Um, in terms of just a really basic outline of like internal party processes, um, quite recently the Labour Party has gone into a uh, stage where we're trying to reform to give greater rights towards ordinary members. So, you know, it started with the right to vote for the leader of the party. When Bill Shorten was elected, 50% of that vote came from members of the Labour Party. That's something that you don't get in the Liberal Party where that's just the caucus room. So again, that, you know, it's the kind of process where you can vote to elect the leader of the party, not 100% caucus, 100% uh, uh, vote of members, but 50%. And the same for pre-selection of candidates. So all candidates that are pre-selected by the Labour Party, 50% of the vote comes from branch members who um, live in the seat of the person that wants to be pre-selected. So there is a level of internal democracy that exists there that does not exist in the Liberal Party. Um, there is actually a push in the Liberal Party right now to democratise those processes and. Um, you know, a push for Liberal Party branch members to have a say in the pre-selection of their own candidates and their leaders, but it's up to the Libs what they want to do. Um, that's just the difference between that. So that's important because if you're talking in a debate about the ability to reform a particular party by being part of that party, you need to understand how the party, you know, how you elect people to positions in a party and those people then subsequently have to be held accountable to you. So if a group of people if, if people want to get pre-selected in the Labour Party, they again have to ensure that they have views that reflect the branch members within that, otherwise they won't get the opportunity to do that. Whereas in the Liberal Party, you've got to make sure that it's the people in power that like you before you do that. Um, because branch members, unfortunately, at this stage don't have a say, but maybe if they're successful in the push to do that, that would be a really awesome outcome. Um, the LMP, I'm just going to go through them 
in one block at the moment because they're in coalition on a federal level. Um, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, Deputy Prime Minister, Liz Barney Joyce is now Michael McCormack, um, who is quite fairly conservative, and the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, which is not the Deputy Prime Minister, he's truly Bishop. Um, the LNP actually is also in another e e uh, ideological split at the moment, where you've got quite moderate figures who are economically more conservative and believe in the free market, but actually socially quite progressive. So people like Warren Edge was a huge push for legalising same-sex marriage. Um, your Turnbull personally, again, doesn't oppose things like same-sex marriage and, and does believe in climate change. People like Christopher Pine, Julie Bishop, all sort of loosely aligned to the moderate faction within the Liberal Party. But then you've also got conservative LNP figures who are socially very conservative. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you guys all know people like Peter Dutton, Eric Betts, um, Tony Abbott come from sort of that right faction at the moment. So the key difference between that is that the moderates believe in the free market. They believe that the government shouldn't interfere in what people are doing. But they're socially, again, in the sort of more libertarian approach, like socially they think, again, the state should interfere in what people are doing in their lives. So they don't have a problem with things like same-sex marriage. You know, a lot of them believe in climate change. They think it's real. We should do something about it. Um, whereas you've got the liberals, on the other hand, who are also pandering to another um, constituency, which is like the really socially conservative people, so people from conservative minority backgrounds. Um, you know, that's what they sort of ran with the whole anti-safe schools campaign, for example, in the lead-up to the federal and state election, uh, to pandit to those groups, uh, people from religious backgrounds, people who are just generally socially conservative um, and want to believe in those values, you know, um, because of the push from the Labour Party to go a little bit left, they've then subsequently joined the Libs and Right. Um, and the Nationals are slightly different because they don't, they don't ideologically align with the Liberals. They're just there because it is convenient for them to be in a coalition together, which is fine. Um, but with the Nationals, their predominant focus is regional Australia, um, not really the cities. Cause like, for example, when we went to Wollongong last year for um, Easter's, that's not, that's a Labour stronghold, the town itself. But the actual cities with farmers, for example, um, are generally quite strong supporters of the Nationals. Um, Greens. So you've got Dean Natali, who's the leader, deputy leader, out of the band, who actually ideologically I don't think are that different from each other. Um, in the sort of Bob Brown era, where the Greens sort of first came and even a little bit doing Christine Milne, they used to be like very heavily surrounded, uh, as in their, their, their base um, and the core identity really used to be about the environment, like they created as, you know, post Tasmanian dams, frankly, dams issue um, in Tasmania, and, and then sort of moved. From there, Tasmania was sort of where they began, which is interesting because they got decimated at the last Tasmanian election, um, and that's maybe something to note. So, the Greens are having a little bit of an identity crisis at the moment, as I really think are all political parties, because we're all sort of having different factions that we need to to, to sort of reconcile. And the Greens would be like, you know, they used to be the party of the environment, they used to be party of like quiet left-wing um, radical people, but their base has kind of morphed into inner city educated and wealthy progressives, um, a lot of whom perhaps had parents who voted for the Liberal Party but now vote for the Greens. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, why did the change happen? Um, I think it's just with when you, when, I think they used to be more of a fringe party, but the Greens are trying to establish themselves as the third major party, or at least as strong as the Australian Dem Democrats were when they were around. Um, and the corollary of be trying to become a, a, a major sort of party is that you then have to become more centrist in order to get more votes. Um, and it just so happened that they were able to bleed votes off Labor educated progressives and Liberal educated progressives, for example, who were really unhappy with the way um, the Liberal Party have treated socially progressive issues. But if you look at sort of the Greens platform, it's quite heavily, well, what they sort of tend to focus on would be socially progressive issues that um, would require people who have, how do I phrase this, like, like, you know, issues like same-sex marriage, issues like refugees, the environment, things which are really core to the Greens' identity, but it's about social... It's, they, they, they're, like, a really good example of, like, identity politics, for example, that a lot of people are accusing the Democrats of doing in the United States. Um, but that's kind of what they're sort of doing at the moment. And 
there's some internal dispute, I think, about the identity and some people are, for example, calling on Dean Natale, who's their leader, to resign after what happened in the Batman by-election when they lost because they're like, we've lost our way, this is not who we are, like, you know, what have we become? We're becoming like a major party and what the Greens like to say is we do politics differently and people are saying you're not doing politics differently anymore, so either, you know, own up to that or... Um, I figure out what you want to do. So I'm not going to comment on Greens internal party politics, but that just is an issue. We don't know how big that's going to be, but um, it'd be interesting to see how they go into the future and how they sort of at that gap where they're acknowledged as like a major minor party. Um, the next one that's not really a major minor party is the Australian Conservatives. Um, Corey Bernardi, for those of you who don't know, defected. He was one of the far-right conservative MPs in the Liberal Party and he was really unhappy with some things that the Liberal Party was was doing and he defected and formed his own um, political party called the Australian Conservatives. Um, you know, I, I would say the key constituencies, and I that's not really sure because there's not a lot of research that's been done on it, but just my educated guess would be, you know, educated conservatives who are unhappy with the Liberal Party, for example, maybe assisting to legalise same-sex marriage, um, evangelicals who, you know, have very, very strong religious views might lean towards Australian conservatives. Um, their performance so far has been quite underwhelming. I wouldn't say they're considered anywhere near a major player in Australian politics. Like, in the SA election, they only had a 14% primary. And also, um, I remember just... Like, sorry? Today, we have to say that they lost their... Yeah, election. so the one dude that they got elected in the upper house in South Australia has now defected to the Liberal Party, so they don't <laughs> have anyone in the SA. Um, in Batman, they only had a 6.5% primary, and that's compared to 23% when the Liberals ran in Canada in 2016. So clearly the Liberal vote don't see themselves as Australian Conservatives because that's a shocking drop in primary. Um, and that's because that's a, the Australian Conservatives is far right of, of the Liberal, we further than their, their um, Conservative base. So if you're in a debate where people need to talk about that, I wouldn't bank on the assumption that they're going to be a major force in politics at this point in time. Um, yeah. The only way that does change is if people like George Christensen and the Nationals do yeah. defect like they're suggesting. And yeah. like, it would not be within the world, beyond the realms of possibility if Malcolm Turnbull would, were to suggest something similarly um, socially progressive as same-sex marriage. You may see more defections to a party like the Australian Conservatives. Yeah, so I think if, if they do defect, then that would obviously make their base a little bit stronger. But... Um, Within the Liberal Party, they've got an internal crisis where they're again struggling to reconcile the moderate conservative base. Don't know if anyone follows Victorian politics, but um, there is a lot of disagreement about certain elements of the Victorian Liberals trying to bring very, like, grow the party with very far right, like, conservative people, and some of the moderates are very unhappy about that. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's a question of who ends up being able to um, win that sort of internal war, whether the moderate forces prevail or the conservative forces do, and it's an unclear question whether they do and whether they'd be able to reconcile with each other. I would go as far as to say as I think anyone's going to defect at this stage, but Corey Bernardi has, and you know his party so far hasn't done all that well, so I don't think they're going to be a major player um, anytime soon. One Nation, Pauline Hanson, everyone knows that. I don't think anyone else in One Nation really matters um, because it seems to me that One Nation's appeal comes from Pauline Hanson and Pauline Hanson only, and she hasn't been able to extend that brand beyond herself. That's my opinion. Um, you know, her key constituencies are sort of like conservative, white, working-class people. Um, she basically <coughs> said Queensland is where they started out. But I don't think they... Um, oh, this was wrong. No, my slides wrong. Really. That was meant to be. That was meant to be the Australian Conservatives. Bit. Let's scrap that. Um, but yeah, so it's like you know, conservative white working class people who um, and, and the platform really is just very anti-immigration and protectionism. Um, she claims to be for working people, but if you look at the policies that she actually votes for in the government, it's actually quite regressive and quite harmful to working people. Like she's considering supporting like company tax cuts. Um, um, by, by the Turnbull government um, and has voted up previous policies as well that's problematic. So it's kind of something that's like Trump-esque, let's masquerade as being for working people and pander to very populist policies and use populist rhetoric, but in reality the actual like research doesn't suggest that the policies get good outcomes for them. Um, so I think 
if you ask me as to what OzPol is about, I would say two things. I think one, it's about democracy, and two, it's about like how we get change. Um, so with democracy, I think you can break down democracy into sort of two sort of issues. One is representation, and one is accountability. They're not answers to this, but I think people need to ask themselves questions when they do OzPol debates in order to flesh out reasons as to why things policies or particular uh, policies or whatever you're debating is a good thing or a bad thing, right? And the first question you need to ask is like, who deserves representation and do people deserve representation in equal amounts? Because if let's look, you know, you've got different groups in society who all have a vote, you all get to vote in elections, right? But then we do certain things, for example, or certain proposals that we make in debating, which is a debate you did maybe about um, the, or, or it's not even a debate, it's a real life thing, right? About whether or not you should create what Turnbull called a third chamber of parliament for Indigenous Australians to have an additional voice within parliament. That's an additional layer of representation that they have that no other group has in Australia. That's, I'm not going to comment on whether that's a good or a bad thing, but the question in the debate is why do they deserve that representation? The AF, you need to prove that they do, on the negative, you need to prove that they don't. They just need to have the same level as everyone else, right? So that's a question that you need to answer. Why does that group deserve that representation? Or why do they deserve it more so than anyone else, or less so than anyone else? And that ties again into the role of the government, because what do you think the role of the government is to facilitate representation in, like, politics? Um, I think the second question that can be debated is, like, who should political parties represent? Because political parties are voted into parliament by the people that voted them in. But once you're in government, you have to govern for everyone. So if you're in a situation when someone's arguing for policy that would make their constituents very happy, but wouldn't make objectively the people, you know, other people that they're, they're meant to represent happy, like, or how do you resolve that? If an MP, for example, the second issue is, has a conscience vote, how do they exercise that conscience vote? And that was a thing, for example, that you see in the euthanasia debate, the same-sex marriage debate. Do they exercise their conscience vote in their own personal conscience? Was that what people elected them to do? Do they exercise that vote for the their constituents? Because many people who voted for pro-same-sex marriage on the um, both Labour and Liberal side came from electorates that voted against same-sex marriage, right? So was it right for them to do that? Or should they vote on what the whole country wants, which is we have a plebiscite that says that should be legal, therefore everyone should vote that that's yes. Like, there's no right answer to this, but this is a question that you must debate in debate. Like, people tend not to answer these questions in debate. So who do they have to represent and why? And you need to come up with a compelling reason. How do you, for um, what reason would you give? For what? For, I'm going to principle the reason for, like, why they represent everybody, but what's in the interest to do that? Sorry, oh, can you repeat your question? So, you're saying like, so representing the constituents or like the majority of Australia? Yeah. Like, like for constituents, it makes sense because you're like, actually votes them in. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense for them practically to appeal to that base. Mm. What's the practical reason for them to appeal to the majority? Um, I think, like, at the end of the day, you could argue that the whole reason why we function, that we've got the system where everyone gets to vote one person and you vote that person in to do that is to get sort of a, an aggregate of all outcomes. Um, and in that sense, you would say that in a utilitarian like approach, you would then want to go with what the majority wants. On the other side, you're saying that's like the tyranny of the majority. You have to represent like minority views. Um, as to like the personal beliefs thing, I think people maybe underestimate how personally like traumatic it could maybe be for a person to vote against something that could be that that really goes against the core of their beliefs because if an MP votes for something like euthanasia that is something that they have to live with for the rest of their lives right like and they maybe will go to bed every night being like that's something that I did and not feel comfortable with that I'm not saying that's the right or wrong thing or that excuses them not voting for what the constituents want but people have to respect that that, that is something that they have to go through. And then maybe that means that if it's an issue of deep personal conscience, then they shouldn't have to make that decision. I don't know. But these all, I think it's debatable anyway. Yep. And that's the point of that. Yep. I think another way of categorising it is to say that when you are elected, you don't, uh, you are not elected by elucidating every single policy that you will ultimately implement. Yep. You're given the capacity to make a judgement in your own personal capacity yep. based upon principles that you've probably talked about. 
at the point at which you aren't, so that, that mandate only extends so far to the policies you talk about, and then beyond that, you're given a personal capacity. Yeah. So at that point, you are probably empowered to make a conscious vote because you were originally empowered to make some value judgments personally in the first place. Yeah, like you don't say this is everything you want to vote for, otherwise we just have direct democracy for everything, yeah. which doesn't work. Um, yeah, so I think that's sort of the questions you need to ask yourself when you're debating issues about representation because people just feel like politicians have to represent people. It's so much more than that. And, you know, if you're saying a particular group deserves more representation, you need to tell me why. Um, the other issue, I guess, it comes down to is accountability because if politicians are there to represent people, how do we ensure that they do that? And that comes from accountability, right? So, obviously, the most obvious way to do that is through elections. There are many problems with elections holding people accountable. Um, for example, elections only matter in swing seats generally. Like, if you're on a safe seat, um, you know, good luck getting a lot of money thrown at, like, your seat to win elections, right? If you look at, there's a term in politics we call pork barreling, which is where parties put a lot of money into marginal seats that really matter. Um, and that, they've done studies in this, and I don't actually remember how much money, but, like, they do put excessive amounts of resources into that. And the question is, does that undermine democracy? If democracy means that parties only focus on marginal seats, like, is that really democracy? Because we're governing for 10% of the nation. Um, I think the other issue is just, like, transparency, right? Like, what... And the question about whether something should be transparent or should be um, put out in the media, where the media comes in, should the media report on it, comes down to one question, is which is, it's a d question about democracy, because it's, and I think people were doing the issue about, like, media should vote on, like, politicians' personal lives without fully understanding the core of that case, right? When you're talking about media reporting on politicians' private lives, it's not about, like, whether we care what politicians do. We don't need to care. Well, we only need to care insofar as it affects democracy, right? So in this sense, I need to know what they're doing so I can form my own judgment and have an informed vote when I cast my vote um, to get representation. And if I don't have informed vote, then this is not true representation because I don't know what I'm voting for. So that's sort of how it all links in. Then the second question is, what do they actually need to know to hold politicians accountable? because certain pieces of information is relevant, other pieces of information are not. Is their character relevant? Is knowing what they did in the past relevant? Or is only knowing what they did in their position and the capacity as a minister or a member of parliament relevant? That's an open question, but that's the issue, right? The core of that issue is it comes back to democracy, it comes back to representation, it comes back to accountability, which are sort of the core principles in... Um, uh, Ospol. I think part of that as well, when you're talking about democracy and representation, um, and just a lead on for that, because it's really, I only just thought of it, I don't have time to put it in, um, it's just ideologically what is the role of the government and how people on the left and right wing sort of see that, because I think you need to understand that to understand why people have certain policies. I think you know, if you're taking a more conservative perspective, economically conservative perspective on the role of the government, it's about the free market, right? Because it's saying that the government's role is to facilitate people making their own choices. And if the market is free and there's no government intervention in what people do, in an ideal world, everyone should be able to make their own choices. So we, the government, they believe it's just like a small government. They don't believe in government intervention to get outcomes because they think people can get that for themselves. Whereas on sort of more left-wing role, the, I think the idea is also that we want to facilitate people making choices, but on the left, economically left side of politics, we don't think people have equal capacity to get choice, so the government's role then is to rectify that inequality in terms of people's access to your choice, so if you're unable to get the same opportunities as someone else because of a system that's not, or a situation that's not fault of your own, then the government should intervene to rectify the inequality, so ultimately you can get access to that choice. Um, and I think for me, fundamentally, that's the difference between left and right, that I don't, you know, they both want the same outcome, which is people to have choice and people to be able to live the lives they want to lead. They just differ as to the mechanism to do that. Right wing says the free market will fix itself. That incentives means that people, you don't want, like, for example, the working class to have no money because otherwise they won't spend and their businesses won't be able to do that and blah, blah, blah. Um, whereas the left wing says we need to intervene to correct those outcomes because the market distorts itself. Um, again, open question either way, but that's fundamentally, I think, the difference in um, uh, uh, sort of the ideas about how the left and right economically wing politics works. Um, what I'm going to go through
different now is sort of the theories of change side of political debates, because I think there are two types of political debates that are about theories of change, right? I think the first political debate, theories of change political debate, is like how do you as a voter get change? Because, for example, if you're a conservative voter, you have so many options. You can choose from the Liberal Party, you can choose from the Australian Conservatives, you can choose from One Nation. If you're progressive, you can choose from Labor, you can choose from the Greens, and a multitude of other minor parties that you can choose from. Um, some people say that you shouldn't even get involved in a political party and that's the wrong way to do things and you should in fact join protest movements on the left or the right to get the outcome that you want. So in a debate you could be encountered with any of those things, right? Which is how do people get changed? This isn't something that's restricted to Auspol, it's something that can be translated across all political systems, um, but the idea behind it remains the same. What do you do um, as a voter who wants to get changed? I think the core of that is voting, the difference is are you voting for a major party or are you voting for a minor party and what change you get as a result of that. With the arguments for you know why someone say would vote for a minor party, um, the, the big, the big um, argument that people propose is like you know the make the keep the bastards honest kind of thing that by having a minor party you hold the major party accountable that they will become either more progressive or more conservative in order to stop the minor party from peeling votes off you right so that means the label with more progressive to stop greens voters going to the greens and the liberals will be more conservative to stop them from leaning to say the australian conservatives um i don't think that's necessarily wrong but i think it only works to a certain extent um, with swing voters because, um, let me have a look, if, yeah, so I think what people sort of say is they're like, we should vote for the minor party to push the major party more to the left than right, but that only works if the people in between the major party and the right minor party actually have the capacity to be are actually swing voters. Like, if the people who have moved from the major party to minor party are like rusted on minor party supporters, like, I'm not going to change back because the minor party will always be more progressive or they will always be more conservative, you don't actually change anything because the incentive actually for the major parties to be like, we have lost that constituency, we need to find another constituency to supplement our votes, and they will eventually at some point stop pursuing that group, right? Which is the opposite outcome you want if your goal is to make that major party more progressive or more conservative. So kind of only works to a certain extent if you have the capacity to be brought back, but if you just like don't come back, then that becomes a different question. Yeah. If you're proving that point, um, in terms of the major party idea, what do you use? Because the other side of the I mean, there's not something they should try to win them over because they can win them over. So as in, like, how do you prove that point that it, that it actually, only works that they've lost it over? Um, I think, ah, oh, um, I don't think there's any minor party that has, like, yeah. completely stolen a, a, a um, yeah. um, but I think what you would sort of say is that if a minor party says they want to be, like, really big, and, and that's what they want to do, um, yeah, I don't think there's any minor party in Australia that has, like, actually gotten to that stage. People were worried that the Greens were going to get to that stage. So, for example, you know, the Greens got a huge swing towards them in North Korea. And if that had happened in Batman, and then that happens in, like, all these other inner city progressive seats in Melbourne, in other cities, you know, they start winning Brisbane, they start winning, like, um, um, you know, South Brisbane, I think, was the one they almost... Well, South Brisbane, and they almost won for Jackie Tried, right? Like that. Yeah, um, if that sort of happened in the sweeping all these inner city conservative, uh, progressive seats, then people, if you think logically, what the ALP would then do is like, there's no point pursuing these voters. And that's what yeah. some people were saying, there's no point pursuing them anymore, let's go somewhere else. But what happened in Batman was that those voters came back to us. Yeah. Um, and then that went people, right, there's still a point electing progressive candidates into parliament because we can still win back those voters. And that is the, the party an incentive to elect people like Jed Kearney, right? Because they think that she's a better fit to get that. So I think Batman's a good example that it does kind of work, but for it's not, um, I, I, don't, I don't really have an example where you kind of like would always just lose because I don't think it's happened before. Yeah. Um, Do you have one? <laughs> The Nationals, surely they gave up and said we may as well 
like part of it is the historically the, co the coalition agreement is to say we cannot continue to win these seats because they can more consistently campaign on rural issues. They were oh, originally so the, 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 the actually national party before the coalition agreement. Like it's quite old, but yeah, and then I think that had the sort of problem of them bringing down the the national party because no one really knows what they sort of stand for if they're coalition and they're so ideologically different. Yeah, but that, that I think that's a, that's a good example of like of of them people people giving up and being like there's no point doing that anymore and yeah, then just you know I'm not sure that the end result is that people would end up coalition with each other, but. That's the example yeah. of trying to find some other solution. Yeah, but, but they know that it doesn't work anymore. Um, and I think, yeah, but over the long term, right now, in terms of any of the recent minor parties, I don't think that we've got to that stage yet. Um, in terms of, like, again, voting for minor parties, some people would say that, because the agenda for minor parties normally is not focused on everything that happens in Australia, but they're often focused on set policy agendas in specific issues. Um, and they'll say that increases airtime for those issues because major parties have so many things to worry about, they're not going to care about like climate change or they're not going to care about safe schools or whatever it is that, you know, the, the focus of that, that party is or, you know, like for one local jobs, they're not going to care about that. Um, or like shooters and fishers, you know, those kinds of things. And they're often raised on like sort of single issue parties or multiple issues, but quite narrow, a narrow scope. Um, and if you believe that increasing airtime will eventually lead to change, which you need to prove to me, um, then that's something you can sort of stand for. Um, I think on a principled level, some people would say that you cannot compromise, fundamentally compromise on key values. I think that's probably true. I think there's certain values that people shouldn't compromise for, on, because otherwise, what's the point of being politics? Um, but that everyone disagrees as to where we draw that line, and that's the issue that's there. And the argument is, if you think that's a really key issue, then you allow the corrosion of values. You become a slippery slope. You lose your morality. What do you stand for? That kind of stuff. Um, ultimately, though, I think minor parties for fairly effective in a balance of power situation, you can generally get whatever you want. Just because you get whatever you want in a minor party in a balance of power situation doesn't mean that's the best long term outcome for you. Um, you know, I would say perhaps the Greens being coalition with Labour on a federal level um, wasn't the best outcome and perhaps some people would say help Tony Abbott get into government quicker which was then worse for people on the left side of politics overall. So was that a good outcome or not? You can make your own assessment about that. Just to be um, sorry, um, how do you prove slippery slope? I don't think you, I don't think that's something that you sort of prove can happen. I think you're saying that like, there's certain key, because it's, it's, it's the, when you want to prove that human rights is a thing in debating argument, which is like, you want to say there's certain key values that are so fundamental that you, they're like enshrined in like what we believe democracy is about or what we believe like human dignity is about that we can't compromise on because if we compromise on then you know what does that make us as a population so it's things like you know very very obviously we don't support genocide right we don't support war crimes we don't support things that are enshrined in international law as really really terrible um and that will kind of be like that so um I don't think, though, that the principle is as important as the practical in, in this argument. Um, in terms of the major party stuff, um, the other side to that is people are like, fight from outside the major party and make the major party more conservative slash progressive. What other people would say, which is like obviously the view that I believe in, is to change the party from the inside. Um, the effectiveness of that depends on the party. Because like I said in the ALP, you can vote for certain you have the right as a member to vote for politicians, to vote on platforms. Um, in the LNP, you can't vote for member of parliament, you can't vote for your leader, so maybe you can't vote to elect more conservative people in, or more moderate people in, whatever it is you want to do. Um, but yeah. And then corrupt and non-liberal types would say that managing the faction situation in Labour is much more complicated than the Liberals, and as a result, it is a harder party to reform on the inside as well. Maybe, but I'd say that like the Lib Lib Libs also have their own internal party problems. Yeah, they, they do, but I'm just saying that like the faction system uh, tied to the union movement as well is another thing you need to navigate. Yeah, I mean it is another thing you navigate, but like um, I think it's not true to say that they're parties without factions. All parties have factions. It's just what you call it. Yes, I'm aware <laughs> all parties have factions, but the allied with the complexities of the union movement as well makes it 
another, that is an obstacle reform, whereas yeah. the LNP has the issue of very limited accountability. Yeah, so yeah, so, but, but if you're voting for like pre-selection in a seat, um, unions don't get a vote on that. So yeah. it's 50% branch and 50% like the state committee, <clears throat> which is comprised by people that we elect. Some are union officials and others are not, but there's no specific vote that you get when you elect politicians. And the best way to sort of change policy, some people would say, is elect more progressive politicians or elect politicians that reflect your views so you get those outcomes. Um, I think what a lot of people in debating maybe sometimes don't necessarily engage with is that you really only can change government policy most of the time if you are in a major party and you are in government. Like, you have to be in government. You can only be in government if you're a major party and you can only influence policy if you are a minor party that holds the balance of power in a Senate or lower house, which is not that rare. And also, because there's so many minor parties that are being elected now, the government can just be like, I don't want to deal with you and I'm going to deal with these other people who get, you know, get me the outcomes that I want. So um, I think that's something that definitely should be raised. And the last thing that people don't seem to also talk about a lot is that when you vote for a minor party which eats off the um, base constituency of a major party, you're actually undermining the ability of the major party to be elected, right? So if you consider yourself progressive, do you want to spend your time fighting other progressives or do you want to spend your time fighting conservatives? Like, at the end of the day, like, you know, it's the same reason why Sanders eventually supported Hillary Clinton because we don't want to spend all our time fighting each other and we need to actually unify and fight people which are ideologically different to us. Um, so it's like you have to have a net cost benefit. Like if what you're doing is undermining the ability of the major party to get elected, it's like what outcome will you actually get as a net benefit? And that's something that you need to consider as well. Um, I think the second theories of change argument in de uh, debate and debating is like how will political parties get voters to vote for them? And that's a debate which I think is about either A, you can take the form of you elect a leader that is like very progressive or very conservative versus a centrist, or you adopt policies that are very conservative or progressive versus centrism, right? Um, and I've just like, for like simplistic purposes, just called it like radical centrist. I think this is, for example, the Corbyn debate. Like, is has Jeremy Corbyn taken the UK Labour Party in the right direction? Um, it's the, you know, um, Bill Shorten versus Anthony Albanese debate. It's the Malcolm Turnbull versus Tony Abbott debate. Like, they're Tony Abbott, Pete Dutton, any number of conservatives that could become leader, who knows. Um, but that's effectively the debate there, right? Sanders, Clinton, it's do we want someone that professes to be quite radical on the spectrum, or do we want someone that's more centrist? I think there's arguments you can make both ways. If you're trying to support someone who's the more radical candidate, or to support policies that are quite radical, you need a, you know, you can talk about energising the base, right? But then that's the question is, why is energising your base important? It's important in terms of, A, growing the party. Like people were saying, after Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the UK Labour Party, memberships, like as ordinary rank and file members who just wanted to join and be a part of that, like skyrocketed, right? Because people felt energised and want to be part of the, uh, wanted to be part of the, the, the movement. Um, in terms of existing members, if your membership's energised, they will get out there and campaign and get out there and vote and they'll help you get elected. And that's, that's a good outcome. Um, I think another thing you can say is that if you're more left-wing, you can have a really clear set of values that people can identify quite quickly with. The problem at the moment, I think, is a lot of people think that all the major parties are the same. They're like, oh, you guys are all corrupt, you're all the same. Like, that seems to be the rhetoric. You're no different from one another. Um, and this helps overcome that thinking that, like, you know, major parties are the same. If you adopt a very distinctly and principally different platform um, to the other people. Um, but then I think on the argument that it should be more sort of centrist, so you should adopt more centrist policy, have more centrist leader, is that, again, if you're pandering to, and if you look at all the different parties that we're talking about and how complicated their bases are and how different the demographics are, then if you move very far one way, you're likely to alienate, alienate a con constituency on the other side of the political spectrum that's still within your base, right? So that's why 
the same-sex marriage plebiscite became a thing because they knew it would win and they knew that it would be voted anyway, they couldn't vote on it because if they just said, let's have a free vote, the Conservatives and Liberal Party would revolt. But if they said, let's not vote on it at all, then the moderates would revolt, right? So it's trying to balance a really um, diverse coalition of interest within every party that means that often parties end up having to adopt a very centrist platform. Um, also, in order to win government, winning government is winning over swing voters, and swing voters very often are quite centrist. Um, that's a generalisation, but generally it's true. Like, you don't have a swing voter that like is very very far generally on the on the political spectrum. Um, and also, if you want to become government, you need to have a mass appeal. Australia is we're not as big as the United States, but we're still very different. Like, Queensland is very different from New South Wales, it's really different from Victoria, right? These are the three biggest states you need to win if you want to win government, and they're all uniquely really different from each other. So, um, you know, in order to have a mass appeal to all the different demographics all across Australia, you need to sort of sit in the centre a little bit, because otherwise the more further you go, the more niche your platform is, the less people sort of buy into that. And I think the argument that, like, parties should move really far left or right is that Preaching to the choir doesn't win elections, and I think a really good example of that is like what happened in Batman, because a lot of people analysed the strategy of the Greens, which is they first talked about Adani, where they couldn't stop, they couldn't talk about Adani anymore. They started talking about refugees, which are both really important issues. Um, uh, obviously, we talk about, but just for the purposes of winning an election. The people they were speaking to were people that were going to vote for Greens anyway because um, they supported those issues. And the question is, how do you win over the people that were undecided between the two? It's not by talking about those issues. It's talking about other issues, right? Um, so that's an example, I think, of why it's important to have a little bit more centrist or really it's just an example of actually knowing the demographics of the seat that you're trying to win and not just speaking to your own voters. Um, you need to win over people that are undecided. So I think that's the sort of second big theories of change debate in, in politics is like how do political parties get voters to vote for them. And that's also important to understand because if you're doing a debate about any kind of policy, like you need to know how the party's going to react to that policy because then you be like, this policy is likely to be successful because parties are likely to take it up for this reason. Um, so I think it's just relevant to like any policy debate that you sort of do. Um, just really quickly to sort of finish up, I think it's important to talk a little bit about how Auspol and the rest of the world, because Australian politics, and a lot of people look at Australia, it's like, this is a really weird country, because like, they don't really understand why we are all so unhappy. So a lot of people from like, the US or Europe have like, commentators have been like, I don't understand why Australians hate their government so much, because you guys haven't had a recession in, in like, in a long time and like your life is like okay and then we get upset about really minor things or, or they think is really minor things right and they're like i don't really understand why i'm happy because if i was there i'd be so happy that like you know i have to deal with trump um so it's it's weird in that like if you ask an australian i think an australian's like ah oh, political system's really bad and like you know they say a lot of terrible things about it they seem to be quite disenfranchised but actually the status quo established in politics is fairly stable in australia um if you look at like other Western liberal democracies like the United States and Europe, either anti-establishment politics is rising, like what happened in Italy in the elections really recently, or at least quite recently it sort of peaked, right? So in UK it's like Brexit, where like Australia wouldn't vote for something like Brexit. I mean there's nothing to vote, I suppose, but like you know, Brexit happened in U in the US they voted for Trump, like I think a lot of them are sort of coming back to realise what they've done and coming back to the centre now. But at some point, in a lot of places in Europe and the United States, like the brand of anti-establishment politics was really popular. Um, and like a lot of people don't really understand why, and I don't really understand why either. Like for me, I think my, my interpretation of how politics is and, and, and that informs my beliefs is that a lot of these rise in anti-establishment politics is widely accepted came from the working class. Um, and I think that it sort of boils down to inequality. Like, if you have a huge recession, you have the GFC, you have countries like, you know, Italy, Greece, and Europe that are struggling financially. Um, that inequality has been rising for a long time. Even in Australia, wages are stagnating. That inequality leads to people being unhappy with the status quo. And as a 
result of that. They lash out. The way they lash out in the electoral system is by voting for populist anti-establishment politics. Um, so that's sort of my um, take on this. I think, though, that there's obviously more nuance to that, because, for example, why is it that more white working class people are voting, say, for Trump, but obviously working class minority people who are as poor or less poor didn't vote for that, right? So there's obviously a racial element to it. So some people say, is it a class thing where you're just talking about class politics? Um, or is it a race thing where it's not just that we now, you know, because, for example, you look at a mining town, they used to have good jobs, so they paid them so much money and everything was fine, and then now everything's becoming economically depressed, they don't understand what's happened, they blame it on immigrants, which is a very simplistic narrative. They came and they took my job. Um, so some people would say, A, it's like they've lost the financial security, but some people might say it's about the loss of the identity um, of their cultural identity, that they see other racial groups coming into their space as diluting their cultural identity. And that's why they voted for somebody like Trump, because he represented like, you know, the embodiment of their the old school sort of cultural identity that they had back then. So I don't know, I think maybe it is a little bit race, a little bit class. It's a bit about identity, it's a bit about economics. I think there's a sort of range of factors that contribute towards it. But that's important to know because I think we're not immune from that. I don't think I could see a world where, you know, One Nation support, for example, just skyrocketed really quickly. Um, maybe not in five years, but maybe 20 years, right? It depends on how we deal with the issue that inequality is really becoming an increasingly big thing. Like if you've got the Reserve Bank saying that people should ask their bosses for a pay rise, you know there's a problem going on in Australia, wages are stagnating, inequality is worsening, and I think we're just not there yet. So we have the ability to avoid that if we have policies that rectify that. But because I think we were spared the brunt of the GFC, we didn't have that kind of you know economic depression hit people um, from the working class, and therefore they don't lash out in the way people in some other groups have lashed out. But I wouldn't say it's not beyond what's happening in Australia. We shouldn't get complacent about it. I think we need to deal that with the fact that inequality is a really big problem, and then inequality leads to like you know outcomes. I think like Trump getting elected, which is why we need to stop that from happening. Um, just the last thing I want to say before I finish off is just the question in Australian politics of like how far can minor parties go? Because obviously a few years ago people have been like, you know, very bullish about the prospects of minor parties. They were like, Xenophon could be Premier of South Australia. It was unlikely, but they reckon they're a decent shot. They were like, he's definitely going to hold the balance of power. Like it's all going to be like a really big thing. Um, we've got three major parties in South Australia. And they didn't win a single lower house seat, and that's a mistake. They won two upper house seats, um, and that's it. Like, you know, they didn't do any better than, like, any of the other parties there. Um, the Batman by-election, he had a swing towards a major party, which seems to be, like, a bit unheard of nowadays. Um, and, you know, the Australian Conservatives as a new party, as a minor party, replacing the Establishment Liberal Party, which did field a candidate, only had a primary vote of, like, 6.5%. Um, in Tasmania, the Greens got decimated pretty badly in that election. Um, they only got two lower house seats, and if you think about that's where the Greens were born, you know, that's the home state of the Greens. Um, that's a pretty poor outcome there. And like in the Queensland election, One Nation only got, you know, one seat back, back when it's peak, when Pauline Hanson was first a thing. I think she had up to like 11 seats in, in um, Queensland Parliament. I mean, I, was, I think it was in unicameral then. I'm not sure. Um, I was in the country then. Um, but the point is, like, I don't think this is anything to say that minor parties are doomed because they're doing quite well relative to where they were, like, 10, 15 years ago. But the question is, like, can they become a third major party? Are we going to be, like, a situation where they're three major parties? Are going to be really big minor parties? It seems to me the trend seems to be creating more and more minor parties that have some prominence rather than just growing, like, a third force. Um, which may be the trend, but I think that's, again, important to identify um, because, don't know, I think that's important to discuss, I guess, because if you're talking about minor parties, you need to know the likelihood of them succeeding. So those are all, like, the random thoughts that I had. Does anyone have any questions about 